fellow lab rats, this is Rebecca from the Lab Rat YouTube channel. In this video, I'm going to be discussing hemostasis and the coagulation cascade. All right, let's get started. Hemostasis is the inherent function of the body that both helps the body to stop bleeding after a short time from injury to prevent extensive loss of blood, and also the uh, also to maintain the blood as a fluid within the blood vessels. So the word heme is Greek for blood, and stasis means to halt. So hemostasis literally means to halt blood. Uh, we don't want our blood to simultaneously clot within our blood vessels, but we do want it to clot and prevent bleeding when we are injured. So this is uh, what hemostasis allows, and it's dependent upon the interaction between blood vessels, platelets, and plasma proteins called coagulation factors. Uh, the process of hemostasis occurs in five steps, and all five of those steps we'll be discussing in this lecture. Now, before I get into the different steps of the hemostasis process, I want to introduce the coagulation factors. Uh, these factors are proteins that are present in the blood that help in something we call the coagulation cascade. The coagulation cascade is a series of steps that the body does in order to stop bleeding that is caused by an injury. Now, each step activates the next step, uh, and then the next step activates the, the following step, and ultimately it produces a blood clot that stops the bleeding from happening. So there are several uh, coagulation factors that you need to know. Uh, not gonna lie, uh, these were kind of the vein of my existence when I was in college, uh, but memorizing them is doable, just takes some effort. I, re I recommend making flashcards or writing them down repeatedly until you know the factor, number, and name. So on, a, on the board or on exam or quiz, um, you, you may be able, uh, may be asked to, you know, what, what is factor three? What's the name for factor three? Or, you know, uh, one of these names, what factor is this? Th those are types of questions that could potentially uh, be asked. Um, so let's go over them here. Uh, basically just going to read them off to, to you. So factor one is fibrinogen. Factor two is prothrombin. Factor three is tissue factor, or thromboplastin. Factor four is calcium. Uh, factor five is proacillerin, a uh, labile factor. Uh, the factor six is unassigned. Uh, factor seven is proconvertin, uh, serum prothrombin conversion accelerator, stable or stable. Uh, factor eight is antihemophilic factor. Factor nine is Christmas factor. Uh, factor 10 is Stuart Prower factor. Factor 11 is uh, thro uh, plasma thromboplastin uh, antecedent. Uh, factor 12 is Hageman factor. And factor 13 is fibrin stabilizing factor. So again, this is just rogue memorization that you do need to know. So this entire presentation is going to be about clotting. Um, and we just talked about the coagulation factors. Those are involved in a coagulation cascade, uh, which helps to stop the bleeding of a, a blood vessel that is bleeding. It's why we don't just bleed out, right? The coagulation cascade um, and platelets are a part of that process. Um, so before we talk about that, though, why isn't the body just simultaneously forming blood clots? Um, so in a normal patient, we should not have blood clots unless there is an injury, right? So why does that happen? Um, so there's three different ways um, of why uh, the, the body doesn't have blood that's just clotting simultaneously. Um, and this uh, slide on this presentation is going to talk about that. Um, so this is a kind of a drawing representation of the inside of a blood vessel. So we have lining of endothelial cells. Those endothelial cells uh, line all of the uh, blood vessels. And then we also have these little blue things, which are uh, represent, representing platelets. Um, in the blood, we also have red blood cells and white blood cells and circulating hormones and things like that, um, but also circulating coagulation factors. Um, so there are three different ways of uh, why the blood doesn't just start clotting um, in the body. And the first way is that these endothelial cells in this lining of the blood vessel um, secrete, just normally uh, secrete two different chemicals. They're called prostacyclin, which is also called PG PGI2 and nitric oxide. And these chemicals, um, react 
with the platelets to keep them uh, inhibited, keep them inert. So these platelets are just hanging out by themselves. They're not clumping into anything. They're not clumping to each other. Uh, they're just inert and just waiting uh, until an injury occurs. Um, so this in inhibition is caused by this prostacyclin and nitric oxide that are secreted by those endothelial cells. Now, the second way is uh, here down here at the bottom, uh, there's a glycosaminoglycan that's called heparin sulfate um, that's present, um, and it actually binds to uh, something we call an antithrombin-3 protein, and this antithrombin-3 protein is just hanging out in the bloodstream as well, all right, and so it's kind of like a lock and key thing, so this antithrombin-3 is able to bind uh, with this heparin sulfate, and what happens in this is that actually, let's get my my pointer here. So there are coagulation factors 2, 9, and 10 that are just hanging out in the bloodstream, okay? And those coagulation factors help the blood to clot, right? So this antithrombin-3 binding with this heparin sulfate uh, inactivates these coag factors. So nothing is clotting, because those coag factors are inactivated. So that's the second way, okay? Now the third way is there's another protein, um, it's called thrombomodulin, all right? And it binds another protein called thrombin or factor two. Um, so <clears throat> again, this thrombin or factor two is just hanging out in the bloodstream. Uh, and then when it uh, finds that thrombomodulin, it attaches and binds to it, okay? And when that thrombin binds to that thrombomodulin, uh, it releases um, uh, a, uh, or forgive me, it's, it, it kind of activates uh, protein C. It doesn't release it, it activates protein C. And protein C is just hanging out as well. Um, so when uh, f uh, when uh, factor two is present, that protein C is active, and this protein C actually degrades more factors, factors five and factors eight, which are hanging out in the bloodstream as well. So it inactivates or degrades those two coagulation factors. So all three of these things, so prostacyclin, nitric oxide, um, antithrombin-3 binding to heparin sulfate and thrombin binding to thrombomodulin. All three of those things work together to keep the body and the body's blood in a fluid state. This is why we're not just simultaneously clotting uh, in our bloodstream. So this slide is saying the exact same thing um, that I just showed you on the previous slide. Um, if you like seeing things written out as, a, as opposed to seeing a visual representation of it, so this is saying the exact same thing. So why doesn't blood just clot in your body just simultaneously? Um, and again, those are three ways. So the endothelial cells on the lining of the blood vessels, um, they secrete those two chemicals, nitric oxide and PGI2, and those inhibit that platelet and uh, the platelets in the bloodstream and those prevent them from binding onto um, the endothelial lining of the blood vessel where an injury occurs and also binding together. Um, then the second way is heparin sulfate um, that binds to a protein called antithrombin-3 and this inactivates clotting factor 2, 9, and 10. Um, and then the third way is um, there's a protein called thrombomodulin um, that binds to a protein called thrombin or factor 2. Um, and when thrombin or factor two binds uh, with that thrombomodulin, um, it activates protein C. And protein C inactivates factor five and eight. And if we don't have platelets that are working, right, if they're inhibited, um, and then we also don't have working coagulation factors, um, this is just going to prevent the blood from just simultaneously clotting, okay? Hopefully that, that makes sense to you. Now onto the, the uh, five steps of hemostasis. These are vascular spasm, platelet plug formation, coagulation, clot retraction and repair, and then lastly, fibrinolysis. Here's the pictorial representation of what's happening when an injury occurs. And of course, we're gonna go over this in, in detail. Um, an injury happens and a blood vessel is severed. All the components of the blood, the red and the white blood cells, the platelets, plasma, et cetera, are leaking out of that vessel opening. The first step of the process is what we call vascular spasm. 
The smooth muscle in the vessel contracts where the injury occurs, hoping to reduce blood loss. The platelets are then activated and begin sticking to each other and to the vessel and form a literal plug over the injury site, uh, blocking the blood components from leaking out. Then the process of coagulation happens. Um, a mesh is formed that helps to trap in more platelets and red blood cells, producing a clot to stop the bleeding. Then the vessel begins to repair itself. Um, we are going to talk about each of these steps in more detail, but this is just an overview for you. All right, so here is this blood vessel again. A uh, reminder, we have that endothelial cell wall uh, lining um, of the blood vessel and the little like lavender colored uh, circles are uh, platelets. So, all right, an injury occurs, right? And so the endothelial lining of the blood vessel is, is uh, ruptured in some capacity. All right, so uh, again, the contents of that vessel, the red and white blood cells, platelets are all gonna be spilling out of that vessel. And obviously we don't want the bleeding to happen. This is blood loss, right? Uh, so the blood loss needs to be prevented. So um, the body's first defense against blood loss is to constrict the blood vessel. Uh, constriction of that vessel is gonna decrease the amount of blood that is gonna be coming out of that break uh, that is in that vessel. Uh, so when the endothelial lining is injured, they secrete something called endothelian, right? Um, and the endothelian is a chemical uh, that binds to a receptor that causes the smooth muscles to contract. And this contraction causes that vasoconstriction, which uh, of course reduces the diameter of the opening in that blood vessel wall. So this vascular spasm that's happening is the first step of hemostasis. Now the second step is platelet plug formation. So those endothelial cells, of course, uh, produce that endothelian, but they also produce something called von Wildebrand's factor, right? So in this representation, the von Wildebrand's factor are these little pinkish circles here. So now uh, remember how we talked about how the endothelial cells secrete prostacyclin and nitric oxide to keep the plate platelets inactive? So when an injury occurs, those chemicals are not released. So the platelets are told uh, to start getting to work. So the platelets bind to that von Wildebrand's factor. Um, and when uh, they do that, they secrete three different chemicals, and these are ADP, thromboxane A2, and serotonin. ADP and thromboxane A2 activate more platelets, and they, they tell the platelets to aggregate to the site of the injury. And this forms a platelet plug. You see all those platelets just kind of uh, aggregating to each other to try to form a plug to keep all of those blood contents um, from getting out. Um, so additionally, serotonin and thromboxane A2 bind to the smooth muscle and causes further contraction of that blood vessel. Now this newly formed platelet plug has a negative charge on it. Um, now, so that's the platelet plug formation, and the next step is coagulation. So uh, now come in those dreaded coagulation factors. So remember at the beginning of this lecture, the, that list of all those factors I told you you have to memorize, so this is where they come in. Uh, so these coagulation factors are proteins that are created within the liver, and they just are hanging out in the bloodstream, waiting to go into action when an injury occurs. So factor 12 here, um, it's also called Hageman factor, sees that negative charge on the platelet plug and gets activated. This activation then activates factor 11, and factor 11 is also called plasma thromboplastin antecedent. This factor 11 activation activates factor 9, which is also called Christmas factor. When factor 9 is active, it activates factor 8, which we call this antihemophilic factor. Now calcium and a, uh, another protein called platelet factor three are floating by in the bloodstream and they see this interaction happening. So they see the activation of factor eight. Um, and this, uh, this uh, platelet factor three um, and calcium uh, help to form a factor eight and nine complex, okay? Um, and this complex helps to drive the activation of factor 10 which is also called stuart prower factor. Now, also in the presence of platelet factor three and calcium, uh, factor five is activated. Um, and uh, this uh, factor five's activation causes circulating factor two to become its active form. 
Um, <clears throat> now, factor two links with a protein called fibrinogen, right, which is up here. Uh, factor two and fibrinogen link together uh, to form something called fibrin. Now, fat, uh, fibrin uh, reacts uh, with um, factor 13 in calcium, and this cross-links the fibrin together. And this creates a fibrin mesh that goes over that platelet plug. See, there's that fibrin mesh there. Uh, and so this fibrin mesh helps to strengthen uh, the platelet plug and prevent that plug from dislodging. Now, platelets work together to pull the edges of the endothelial cells together. Um, and they secrete a chemical called platelet growth factor. Uh, this triggers the repair to collagen and smooth muscle. And the platelets also secrete vascular endothelial growth factor, which helps to regenerate the endothelial lining of the injured blood vessel. So there's that PGF and VEGF um, that's helping to pull those together and repair that collagen and smooth muscle and blood vessel lining. Okay, so what we just talked about is the intrinsic pathway 12 to 11 to 9 to 8 and 8 combines with 9 to activate 10. Um, this is a, a pathway that happens independently um, of something we call the extrinsic pathway. Um, so in addition to all of this, right, so yes, wait, there's more. <laughs> Uh, in addition to this, when tissues are damaged, they release tissue factor, which is also called factor three. And factor three reacts with factor seven here. Um, and factor seven is just hanging out in the bloodstream and it reacts with factor three and factor seven becomes active. And the active uh, factor seven stimulates uh, both the factor nine activation and it also converges into the common pathway into factor 10. So this is the extrinsic pathway. So what we were just talking about, 12, 11, 9, 8 into 10, that is the intrinsic pathway. And then the three and seven into 10, that is the extrinsic pathway, okay? Hopefully this helps make a little bit of sense. Okay, so we have this platelet plug and this fibrin mesh over that plug. Uh, the area is repaired, uh, but we still have that plug in the mesh, right? So how do we get rid of this? So on the endothelial cell lining of that blood vessel, there's a protein called tissue plasminogen activator, as you can see here in this little pink uh, structure. Um, <clears throat> there's also a protein called plasminogen that's just hanging out in the bloodstream. So it's hanging out in the bloodstream and it reacts with this tissue plasminogen activator. And this creates something called plasmin. And plasmin is the key here. So plasmin then digests this fibrin mesh. Um, so you see that fibrin mesh uh, goes away and the platelets start to dissipate. And you see that there is a, uh, a repaired blood vessel there, which is fantastic. That's the whole point of this. Uh, now, when the plasmin um, digests that fibrin mesh, it releases a little fibrinogen and also something called D-dimer. Now, this is where us as medical laboratory professionals come into play. Remember the terms fibrinogen and D-dimer, because guess what? We test for those. I created this drawing for you to be able to uh, remember the pathways. So the intrinsic pathway is factors 12, 11, 9, and 8, and goes into 10, which is part of the common pathway. And the extrinsic pathway is factors 3, 7, and goes into 10, which of course is part of the common pathway. Uh, the factors 10, 5, 2, and 1 are considered the common pathway. Both the intrinsic and extrinsic pathways operate independently of one another. So why does this even matter? Why do we have to know these pathways as laboratory professionals? It's because we test these pathways. So coagulation testing is performed on light blue top tubes, which contain sodium citrate anticoagulant, which prevents the blood in this tube from clotting. Now it's absolutely imperative with these tubes that the blood is filled to the etched fill line that's present on the tube shown with this arrow on the right hand side of the screen. The reason for that is there is a very specific anticoagulation ratio, so nine parts blood to one part of that sodium citrate anticoagulant. If the blood is not filled to the line, the anticoagulation ratio will give you incorrect results. Now, this is not a suggestion. It is a requirement. If it's not filled to that line, it cannot be run and has to be redrawn. Also, this tube cannot be clotted. If a clot is present, it must be redrawn. So these coagulation tests determine when a clot is formed and produce a result from that. So if the specimen in the tube is already clotted before the test is run, you're going to get an inaccurate result. 
The tests we run on these light blue top tubes are PT, APTT, fibrinogen, D-dimer, and platelet function, all of which we're going to discuss. The first coagulation test we are going to be discussing is prothrombin time. It's also called PTINR. This evaluates the extrinsic and common pathways, so factors 7, 10, 5, 2, and 1. This test is used to monitor anticoagulant therapy, like uh, if the patient is given warfarin, which is a, an anticoagulant that keeps um, the uh, blood from uh, like forming clots. The INR is a means to standardize PT reporting worldwide. So this is a calculation done by taking the patient's PT and dividing it by the control PT. Normal range for prothrombin time is 11 to 13.5 seconds, and INR is 0 0.8 to 1.1. Prolonged PT INRs can indicate factor deficiencies in the extrinsic or common pathways. The PT INR test is done by first centrifuging the blue top tube. The plasma is aspirated into an aliquot. It's mixed with calcium to reverse the effects of the anticoagulant citrate. This allows the plasma to clot again. Then factor three is added to the sample to help initiate the extrinsic pathway. The time it takes for the sample to clot is the, the measurement. The activated partial thromboplastin timer, APTT, sometimes referred to as PTT, a test evaluates the intrinsic and common pathways of the co coagulation cascade. So 12, 11, 9, 8, 10, 5, 2, and 1. This test is used to monitor the effects of uh, therapeutic heparin, which is used to prevent a patient's blood from clotting. The normal range for APTT is 23 to 25 seconds. The activated partial thromboplastin time test is done by first centrifuging the blue top tube. The plasma is aspirated into an aliquot, and then it is mixed with calcium to reverse the effects of the anticoagulant citrate. This allows the plasma to clot again. Then, an activator such as silica or kaolin is added to the plasma. The time it takes for the sample to clot is measured. If the patient's APTT is prolonged, this can mean a couple of different things. If the patient is using heparin and the sample is contaminated with heparin, uh, this, can cause the, this can happen if the sample is drawn from a line that has heparin in it. If a patient has a coagulation factor deficiency, uh, there may also be something we call uh, coagulation factor inhibitors. Uh, this means that the patient is not deficient in factors, but is bleeding too long because those factors are inhibited. Or if the patient is septic, so coagulation factors can be consumed in cases of sepsis. Now to distinguish between the causes, mixing studies are performed on the patient, which we'll talk about on the next slide. So mixing studies are also performed in the coagulation department in the laboratory. When a patient has a prolonged PT or PTT, it can be caused by a factor deficiency. So a coagulation factor that is missing or in a decreased amount, or it can be caused by a coagulation factor inhibitor. So there are normal amounts of coagulation factor, but they are being inhibited by something. So how mixing studies are performed is the patient's plasma with either prolonged PT or APTT is mixed with a normal plasma sample and the PT or APTT is run again. Now, if the patient is deficient in a coagulation factor, the normal plasma will contain normal amounts of that factor and the PT or APTT run will be normal. If the PT or APTT does not correct, that is to say still says abnormally prolonged, the patient likely has a coagulation factor specific inhibitor. So mixing studies are used to determine between a factor deficiency or a factor inhibitor. Now remember uh, back when I was talking about how the fibrin mesh is degraded after the endothelial lining of the blood vessel is repaired after injury? Tissue plasminogen activator binds with plasminogen and this activates plasmin to go and degrade that fibrin mesh coat um, over the platelet plug. And this degradation causes the release of D-dimer and fibrinogen. We can test for both of these things. So this is D-dimer. So this is what we call a fibrin degradation product, which makes sense because it was created by the fibrinolysis step of the hemostasis process when that fibrin mesh got busted up. This test is used to help diagnose uh, thrombosis, which is a blood clot. This can happen in things like thromboembolytic disease and something we call disseminated intravascular coagulation or DIC. Thromboembolytic disease is where 
Blood clots form the deep veins of the body. And DIC is a serious condition where the body clots in various places and uses up all the coagulation factors, so it leads to massive bleeding elsewhere in the body. And both of these conditions are very deadly. Fibrinogen is another of the fibrin degradation products. The normal reference range is from 200 to 400 nanograms per milliliter. A decreased level of fibrinogen can indicate severe malnutrition or liver disease, DIC, which we've already talked about, or rare inherited disorders. An increased level can be associated with cancer, inflammatory disorders, trauma, infection, or even stroke. The platelet function screen analyzes the functions of the platelets to form clots. Abnormalities may indicate von Willebrand disease, uremia, or inhibitors uh, that do what you think they would. They inhibit that platelet. So let's look at pictures of these analyzers for these tests. Uh, so this is a picture of a platelet function analyzer. This is a benchtop automated instrument that assesses the platelet function under shear stress. This instrument uses a cartridge that has collagen and ADP and also collagen and epinephrine. The laboratory technician pipettes whole blood into the cartridges and in several minutes results will be produced. So the cartridges go in here and then you pipette uh, the blood into each of those cartridges and tell it to run. Now these are two different kinds of coagulation analyzers. Uh, the one on the left is an ACL top and the one on the right is called a STAGO. Uh, these perform things like PT, PTTs, D-dimers, fibrinogens, etc. The main difference between these two analyzers is their methodologies. The STAGO uses something we call a mechanical clot method. Uh, the aliquot that the patient's plasma is placed in has a tiny uh, like magnetic ball inside of it. And that ball rocks inside of the aliquot and when a clot forms, the ball stops moving. And the time that happens is how, how the instrument produces the result. So the ACL top uses a photo-optical turbidometric method. Uh, both of these analyzers produce very reliable and accurate results, and they're actually very easy to uh, use. I've, I've used both of them. The last coagulation analyzer photo here is called the thromboelastograph, or the TEG. At the time this lecture was recorded, this is a fairly new analyzer. This analyzer measures the ability of the patient's whole blood to clot. This is considered a comprehensive look at the overall process of clotting. Okay, so this concludes this lecture on hemostasis. Please make sure to give it a like and subscribe to my channel. And as always, if you have any questions, feel free to leave them down in the comments. I'm happy to answer them for you. All right, until next time.